Welcome back, everybody. Good to see you again. So from now and uh, till roughly the uh, end of the semester, I mean, when we have the last lecture, we're going to have uh, basically uh, online sessions in this kind of mode with a Zoom session. So what I wanted to do now in the beginning is to uh, link a little bit back to what we did last week. So I want to give you a quick reminder of uh, the topics we discussed and what kind of strategies we need to uh, look at. And then today we are going to enter into a new topic, which is going to allow us to uh, develop what I would say, a uh, together with parallelization, which will be the last topic, we are, are going to have what we might define as a more professional production ready Monte Carlo machinery for solving uh, many body problems in quantum mechanics. So the uh, topic today is to give you first a quick reminder from last week on optimization methods and which are the elements we need to program. And then we're going to jump into the new topic, which is resampling techniques and statistics. As some of you may have seen these things in uh, courses like uh, 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 Computational Physics 1, you may have seen it in uh, a standard machine learning course like uh, FIS SDK 4155 or any other uh, course which deal with machine learning where statistical resampling techniques are used. And you may have encountered a method which is called the bootstrap method. So the bootstrap method is one of these ways which allows you to get a better estimate of the standard deviation from the expectations values which you calculate. So the aim with these techniques, and this again doesn't sound that exciting, but it's actually needed because at the end, we have to provide error estimates of our expectation values. So when we calculate the energy, it's a uh, big sin if you publish a, a result without a statistical error estimate. And in our case, this is going to be the standard deviation. The problem we suffer from is that we always will have limited statistics when we evaluate expectation values. And then the question is, are we approaching the true mean value, for instance? Are we uh, able to evaluate the true uh, standard deviation? Now, there are techniques in statistics which allow you to get a reliable, and I'm saying reliable, because uh, you are not able, due to the finite statistics you have, to get the exact mean value or the exact standard deviation. But there are techniques which allow you to say that my results are as reliable as they can be. So one of these techniques is bootstrap, which many of you have encountered. This is often used on smaller data sets. The technique which we are going to implement is the so-called blocking technique which is a technique which is very uh, reliable in producing the correct estimate for the standard deviation when you have large samples of data. And large samples of data are given by our Monte Carlo simulations because we are going to produce millions and millions of uh, stochastic events. And from these millions and millions of stochastic events, we can actually perform a pretty decent estimate of the standard deviation. And this is a little bit about what this uh, kind of topics are going to rotate around. So, but let me go back a little bit to the whiteboard and uh, set up the kind of overarching uh, things which we need to deal with. And uh, so let me just quickly bring back the, uh, the whiteboard before we jump a little bit back between the uh, lectures which we, had last week and the week before, just to quickly remind you of uh, some of the technicalities. So what we have is uh, now we have developed a uh, variation of Monte Carlo machinery. Where we have the Metropolis Hastings algorithm, which means that we are doing also important sampling because we have a conditional probability for making a specific uh, transition. So that means that we also have included important sampling. 
the uh, topics which we discussed last week was the optimization of the variational parameters. Of the variational parameters. And in our case, this deals simply with if we now make a plot of a one dimensional function of the energy as a function of uh, the parameter alpha, then we have the expectation value of the energy, which I just write as an E here. And when we plot it, what we are interested in now is to find the optimal parameter. So we often label that with a hat. And we would typically start with some guess which we call an alpha zero. And then by calculating the gradients of delta E, in this case, it's just a derivative. We don't need a gradient because we have only one variable. Then with a gradient, we would then descend with few Monte Carlo cycles towards the correct minimum here. So the aim of that one is to find this alpha opt with few cycles, Now, these are few Monte Carlo cycles in order to be able to start the large scale calculation in order to launch the final VMC calculation with this parameter alpha opt, the optimal parameter, variational parameter, so that we can launch the final VMC calculations with uh, alpha opt in order to have as much statistics as possible. With statistics, I mean uh, Monte Carlo samples in our case, to have, uh, to have a reliable, or to obtain a reliable, statistical determination. And when I say reliable, it's simply as many Monte Carlo cycles as we are willing to spend or can spend, reliable statistical determination of various expectation values. Now, what comes next now is something which we are going to deal with now, and these are the resampling techniques. And the whole idea behind the resampling techniques is actually to be able to estimate reliably the uh, error estimate and the statistical expectation values. They are used to provide a reliable, and we are coming back to what we mean with reliable, estimation of expectation values with error estimates. I'm just writing this down so that we have the kind of overarching picture before we dive into the details. So expectation values with well-defined statistical uncertainties. And in our case, the statistical uncertainties is going to be the standard deviation. Uncertainties. We are not going to calculate uncertainties on the parameters, but we are going to calculate the uncertainties on the final expectation value in our case, this is going to be the final expectation value for the energy. And in our case, what that means is that we are calculating an expectation value of a given function. So I'm just putting this up as an f of x. And that is given as an integral over the domain of events, which we have, the stochastic events. There's a probability distribution. And this is multiplied with this function f of x and given by d of x. And I'm not specifying whether this is a multidimensional or a just a one-dimensional system. 
and we can calculate moments of this quantity. So we can have f of x to the power of n, and that is obviously given by x. So I'm just reminding you of some of these elements from statistics. So this is to the power of n of d of x. And then the quantity which we are interested in is obviously the energy. So in our case, this f of x is the local energy. And uh, we have a discrete uh, summation of uh, stochastic events. So we do not have the possibility to calculate the continuous uh, with continuous variables. So we will have to content ourselves with uh, a stochastic sampling, which contains a set of discrete configurations or positions in this specific case. Now, the next quantity which we want is obviously the variance. And we are going to write that one. So the variance of this quantity f of x is normally written as a sigma squared of f. And that is given in terms of the expectation value of f of x squared. And we have been calculating this already, f of x squared. So that's the moment here minus the expectation value squared. So this is a quantity which we then use to calculate the uh, standard deviation width. So this is again given by an integral from x over the domain of events which we have. We have a probability distribution. And then this is given by f of x minus the mean value. And I'm going to call this mean value here from mu of f minus mu of f squared of d of x. This is uh, the quantity which we approximate with a one over m, where m is the number of Monte Carlo cycles we are running the calculations with. And then we end up with the f of x of i minus this mu of f. And we have to put a bar on it because this mu of f, which we calculate, is not necessarily equal to mu of f, which we put up as the exact mean value of, the, of this specific variable. That means also that the variance which we get here may not be the exact variance. So we don't know that a priori. So what we are calculating is actually the sample variance. So the quantity which we are putting up is something which I'm going to use a, a new label on. So that's going to be a sigma f with a bar on top of it. And this is what we call the sample variance. Now, the uh, uh, variance is then used to calculate the standard deviation. So the SDD, standard deviation, That's the quantity which gives us the error estimate. So this is actually given by the square root of um, the sigma squared of f. And this again is an approximation because we don't have the exact uh, uh, variance. So the, uh, the problem which we face then is uh, that the quantities which we calculate are not necessarily equal to the exact ones and the same with the variance here, is not necessarily equal to the exact variance. And we have to live with that. Now, uh, what we are going to use now is a method which is called, we're going to introduce this uh, blocking method. And this is the way by which we will uh, try to make a as reliable estimate as possible of the variance with the data which we have. And with that data, we uh, are going to provide an uh, error estimate on the energies which we calculate. So there is no Monte Carlo calculation, which is actually a stochastic evaluation of an integral. There is no Monte Carlo calculation without a proper error estimate. And uh, it, as I said in the beginning here, it doesn't sound like the most exciting thing, but you will not get your results published if you don't provide an error estimate. That's, it's as simple as that. So I've had cases where I've been a referee on scientific papers, where both referees have simply uh, sent the paper back to the authors and asked them to put on error estimates on the calculations. 
So that's a fundamental sin in this kind of stochastic evaluations of uh, uh, expectation values. So what we have now is when we've done the optimization of the parameters, we found a uh, optimal parameter. And from that, we are going to mount millions of, or even billions of Monte Carlo calculations. And with this result, we can then, uh, with as much statistics as we have, we can then make an estimate of the errors. And then we are basically done. So the resampling part is actually needed in any Monte Carlo evaluation. And then finally, the, uh, the last part, which we are going to introduce, which comes uh, in close to the week before the Easter break, is actually parallelization. And that will be the last element, which we will need in order to have a uh, efficient Monte Carlo calculation of the uh, quantum mechanical expectation values. Any questions so far? So this is more the overarching picture of uh, what we uh, need to do. And uh, till now, what we have is the optimization part. So we have, uh, hopefully, we have this piece and we have this piece. And now we need to add the resampling piece. So what I'm going to do first now is just to quickly remind you about the optimization part. And the, in the optimization part, the, uh, the task is to find this alpha optimal. And since we only have one of very few parameters, I would normally recommend to use a standard gradient descent. That's the simplest way we can implement this, but we need to evaluate integrals. So let's go back to the uh, uh, topics, which we had just some time ago. And let me quickly remind you of the material which you have access to. So uh, if we go back in time a little bit and we go back to the week of February 20 to 24, we actually introduced this kind of a top-down uh, approach, which we needed to implement. So we uh, looked at the way we could implement the uh, method, the gradient descent method. So what we have to calculate, if we scroll down a little bit, we have to evaluate and three integrals, which contain the derivative of the uh, expectation value of the energy with respect to the parameters alpha. So this involves a derivative of the wave function, which we could, this term is something which we could rewrite in terms of the derivative of the log of the wave function, which is also very convenient because the wave functions are often given in terms of exponentials. And that simplifies the uh, calculations actually with respect to number of floating point operations. So we have to evaluate this integral. We have to evaluate this integral and that integral. And that clearly complicates life because now suddenly we have three stochastic integrals which need to be evaluated. And each of them will normally be evaluated in order to find the optimal parameter with less Monte Carlo cycles. And less Monte Carlo cycles means that we will have a results which may have larger errors. So typically what people would do then is to rerun many of these calculations with few Monte Carlo cycles and then take the average of the optimal parameters and then launch a Monte Carlo calculation with these optimal parameters, which is an average of several of these searches for the optimal values. So this is the overarching thing. And then in the slides, you will find an example on this being implemented on a two electron system. And if you take away the uh, correlated part of the wave function, this is essentially two electrons in a two dimensional harmonic oscillator. So it's pretty close to the system which we have. And here I have analytical expressions for the wave functions and the local energy, the derivatives, et cetera, the quantum force. So this includes the Metropolis Hastings algorithm. And then there's an energy minimization part where in this case, I have two parameters. And if you scroll down now, I calculate these three integrals and they are given by these variables, which you see here. That uh, produces the derivatives, which are sent back to the code. And this is simply this expression, which you see here. That's the one which we had uh, the analytical expression for. It returns the derivatives. And then it simply contains a uh, basic gradient descent method without a convergence criterion in case the gradients are small. And uh, here you can see the result which you get. And you see that the gradients will never vanish properly. 
So you have to set up a stopping criterion. The exact energy is 3.0, and this is what you should get. Now, uh, as we mentioned last time, uh, there are uh, alternatives to uh, this more brute force gradient descent. And one is to use something which is called uh, a quasi-Newton method, which is given by Broyden's algorithm. And we provide you with both C++ programs and the uh, uh, way you can implement this method in uh, scientific Python. So again, what you need if you use uh, either the C++ code or the scientific Python uh, codes, what you would need to do then is to have a function for the derivatives. So you need to provide that and also a function for the energy itself. And basically what this energy derivative does is to calculate the derivatives. So there's nothing, no surprise here. And Broyden's method is a method which uh, uses an approximation for the second derivative and tries to estimate this iteratively. So you actually, instead of having a constant parameter, as we discussed last time, it uh, tries to estimate the second derivative. And this is a method which uh, I normally recommend to use. It gives pretty precise results. And uh, it gives you here the optimal parameters for alpha and this parameter beta. And you can see now that it uh, gives a result which is pretty close to the exact one. So the exact one is 3.0. What you would typically do is to rerun these calculations and then take the average of the parameters you get because you start this in a random way. So it's a stochastic calculation. And then when you've done that, you would typically uh, then launch the big Monte Carlo calculations. So next week, we will see how we can implement this blocking method. But the aim today is more to give you an overview of the necessary statistics so that you can understand what these methods are doing. And then we discuss the implementation in the beginning of the next lecture, which means next week. Now, in the slides from last week, if you go back there, not these ones, but these ones, there we had a long discussion of gradient methods. And uh, the uh, we discussed both the uh, semi-Newton methods like Broyden's algorithm, we discussed methods like steepest descent and conjugate gradient descent. So these are very popular methods, but they rely on you being able to calculate the second derivative. And this is normally the uh, bottleneck when you are setting up this kind of uh, iterative ways to find the uh, zeros of the gradients and where the function has its minimum. And uh, typically, we would not use the steepest descent and the conjugate gradient descent. But the uh, method of choice, when you have very few parameters, is typically either uh, Broyden's algorithm, which is a quasi-Newton method, or you could just implement a plain gradient descent. Now, when you use a plain gradient descent, what we normally recommend then is to use gradient descent with momentum, as we discussed last week. Alternatively, there is a lengthy discussion on stochastic gradient methods, but this is something which becomes more interesting when you have many parameters. So for the case which we are dealing with now, with only one variational parameter, a stochastic gradient descents may become an overkill. And then uh, finally, there is a uh, discussion on automatic differentiation. And this automatic differentiation is something which uh, I normally recommend to take a look at. Uh, the reason why I recommend it is that it uh, allows you to, for instance, calculate the local energy uh, when you have an analytical expression for the wave function, which is the common case. It's easy to calculate the uh, derivatives of the kin for the kinetic energy, which means that it makes it much easier to set up the local energy and perform the calculations because you can use automatic differentiation to find the second derivative and the first derivatives, which you use also in a quantum force and the local energy to find analytical, not analytical expressions, but to be able to calculate to these derivatives to numerical precision. So I would recommend uh, if you have time to take a look at the information which we have here on automatic differentiation and how to use it.
because if you change the wave function, so one alternative is obviously to calculate all these derivatives by paper and pencil and then program them. But with automatic differentiation, you can often simplify everything. And every time you try a new wave function, it's very easy then to actually change and uh, uh, run the calculations without going through lengthy analytical paper and pencil exercises. So this is a kind of overview of what we have done. And now comes the part of uh, what we need to have a, an understanding of, and that deals with the statistical expectation values. So what we are going to do now is to go back to the material for this week after this lengthy overview. And we are going to look a little bit about uh, some statistical quantities. And we are going to switch a little bit between the whiteboard and the slides here. So the uh, thing which we mentioned is if we scroll down here, there's a basic motivation for why we use uh, resampling methods. So these are actually indispensable tools in modern statistics. So they involve repeatedly drawing samples from a training set and refitting a model of interest. And the reason why you use these resampling techniques is that in many cases, you will not be able to produce new data. So the data you have is the data you have or are the data you have. Data is the plural of datum. So I should use the right verb here and conjugation. So uh, in order to estimate the uh, variability of, let's say, if you perform a linear regression fit, you can actually repeatedly draw different samples from the training data. And the resampling techniques uh, can be uh, expensive computationally. Many of you have met something like the cross sampling cross-validation uh, and the bootstrap method. Uh, they are actually very important tools in practical applications of many statistical learning procedures. So this cross-validation is used to estimate the test error associated with a given statistical learning method. Uh, blocking and bootstrap are methods which have been widely used on the, the analysis of uh, statistical Monte Carlo calculations in order to get a good estimate of the standard deviation. So the bootstrap is a very simple method and it's widely used. So why should we do that? Now, basically our simulations are, can be treated as computer experiments. And this is particular uh, the case for Monte Carlo methods. The results can be analyzed with the same statistical tools as we would use analyzing experimental data. Actually, these methods like Bootstrap are widely used in the anal statistical analysis of experimental data. And as in all experiments, we are always looking for expectation values and how accurate they are. So we need uh, to find and have an estimate of sources of errors. So in our case, uh, there are actually uh, two types of errors which we have. So one is the statistical error, which follows from the calculation of the Monte Carlo evaluated integrals. So we are evaluating the integrals with stochastic methods. And then we have systematic errors. So what we are going to deal with here are the statistical errors. So these are errors which we can estimate reliably using the tools which we are going to present here. However, the systematic errors, they are much, much more difficult to uh, evaluate and to uh, assess. And one of the reasons for that is that these deal with fundamental uh, approximations to the, let's say, in this case, the physics. So one systematic error, which we cannot quantify properly, is actually the Hamiltonian, which we are using to describe this system. So it's only the interface with experiment whether we can see uh, if that Hamiltonian makes sense or not. So there are systematic errors in the setup, which are very difficult to assess. So our focus will be only on the statistical errors because there we can use standard tools from statistics. And uh, I mentioned to you that the typical approach is to have a probability distribution. So what you will see here is, is just a reminder of what we put up in the beginning. But what I wanted to bring up now, uh, besides this kind of uh, simple statistics, so this is just a quick reminder of statistics. And you can take a look at that through the slides. And we already put this up on the whiteboard. Uh, 
So we uh, would typically calculate moments, and one of the central moments is the variance. And that gives us the deviation from the mean value squared, which means that it emphasizes outliers. Since we have a squared uh, value, which is so we square the difference between the value x and the mean value which we have. So the variance is a very important quantity. And as you can see, when you write it out here, this is just given by the expectation value of x squared minus x, the mean value squared. And the square root of this variance is the standard deviation of p. And uh, this is the quantity which we are going to uh, look after. Now, uh, one of the things we have to come back to is actually uh, about the reliability of the calculations which we are making. And in our case, we will evaluate these quantities statistically, which means that uh, we will have a limited set of data in order to evaluate these quantities. And it, we may not have the correct, or we may not be approaching the correct values. Uh, so there is a quantity which we need also because the data which we have they will show some degree of correlation. So we are going to uh, uh, introduce also something which is called the central limit theorem and just remind you about that, what that means, and uh, what are the basic assumptions behind deriving the central limit theorem, because that uh, tells us what kind of distributions our variables will take in the limit of uh, a huge set of measurements. So the covariance uh, is something which measures the correlations between stochastic variables. And uh, the covariance, if we now have uh, a probability distribution, which is a so-called probability distributions for identical distributions. So if Xi and Xj have the same distribution and they are independent and so-called identically distributed, identically distributed because then they have the same distribution, then uh, we can show that the covariance is exactly equal to zero. So in general, however, the covariance is given by the quantity which you see here. So the um, uh, statistical uh, elements which we are going to deal with now uh, is something which uh, is going to allow us to rewrite the uh, variance. And we are interested in what's called the sample variance. And we're going to rewrite that in terms of the covariance and the variance of just a single set of experiments. So if you have a, a so-called identically distributed stochastic variables, which are independent, then you can show that the variance, uh, the covariance has to be equal to zero. So with the stochastically independent ones, what it means, and if we just scroll down a little bit here, uh, or rather I should actually rather put that one back into the, uh, into the whiteboard. So the covariance is something which you can rewrite in terms of uh, these expectations values here. So if we have uh, independent uh, variables, which are identically distributed, then this quantity here is exactly equal to zero. So let's just uh, see that when we go back to the whiteboard here. So let's just change to the whiteboard and remind you about some of these elements from statistics. And I'm picking, I'm selecting these quantities which are most relevant to the kind of analysis which we are going to do now. So we define the covariance Let's just bring up this statistical elements. So this is just the background statistics which is needed in order to understand methods like the bootstrap and the blocking method. So when we have a so-called IID, this means that we have independent and identically distributed stochastic events. 
stochastic events. If we have that, then this covariance between two variables, x of i and x of j, so these can just be vectors which now contain a set of observations. This quantity is now given as an integral over dx i, dx j. There's a probability distribution for x i and x j. And this is multiplied with x of i minus the mean value of x of i, which may not be the same as the mean value for x j. So we have the observation here, and then we have the mean value here. So this is the formal definition of the covariance for a, uh, a set of stochastic variables, uh, which are now defined by continuous variables. There is an alternative uh, uh, discrete variant, which I'm not setting up here. So if we have IIDs, what that means is that this probability distribution, PXI of XJ, is going to be given by a probability distribution for xi and a probability distribution for xj. And I'm writing these with the same letters, lowercase p, because they are identical. And we're assuming that these are independent variables. And then you can quickly see that the covariance in this case of x of i and x of j. So this also means that xi, the mean value, is equal to xj. And we are simply going to write this as an x bar here. And that quantity is then given by the mean value of x, which is p of x of d of x. And as I said previously, I'm not saying anything of whether these are multidimensional objects or just a one-dimensional object. So the covariance then is something that you can see that quickly. This becomes dxi. And then I have a p of x of i. And then I have the integral x of i minus x here. And then I have the new integral dxj, which now contains pxj. And then I have an xj minus x here. And if I now evaluate these quantities, I just get two uh, expressions which are going to cancel each other. And you can see that uh, easily because what we get then is a quantity xi, xj here. These are the expectation values minus x. I'm just going to rewrite that one. Minus x squared. Now, if we now look at these quantities, expectation value here, this one, that is just going to be given by dx of px of i multiply with x of i, and then we have a new integral dxj of pxj of xj. And this is nothing but x bar, and this is x bar, the mean values. So this is identical to zero. So the covariance measures also the degree of correlations between different variables. Now, we will always have some correlations between the x's. So if you're thinking of a, a standard Monte Carlo procedure where we use a random number generator, these random number generators which we have, they are not true random number generators. They're actually given by deterministic algorithms. So that means that there are going to be correlations between X values at different in different stages of the Monte Carlo sampling. And we are going to have a, a covariance, which is going to be different uh, uh, from zero, simply due to the fact that we have a uh, deterministic random number generator. And uh, remember again that the random number generators we use, they uh, are used so many times that we want to have an efficient algorithm, which produces a random numbers as quickly as possible. And the standard algorithms given by these deterministic algorithms they give us some small correlations. So we will have a co covariance, which is non-zero, even if the stochastic events are produced by a probability distribution, which is the same for both sets of data. And these kind of covariances uh, due to the random number generators is something which we have to live with. <laughs>
So in our calculations, the uh, covariance is not going to be exactly equal to zero, even if we assume that we have independent variables or IIDs. So the, there is an important theorem, which you may have heard. Uh, in the lecture notes, you will find the proof for it. So I'm just gonna state the theorem here. So this is the central limit theorem. And we're gonna state this one before we take a small break. So it's a useful, it's useful to remind ourselves about the central limit theorem. So if we have uh, an uh, IID, so suppose X is, ele is an element of an independent and identically distributed distribution, which we're just going to call P of X. Now, what happens then that if we now perform a set of measurements, so suppose we have a series of measurements where we now generate these numbers according to these specific distributions. So that could be a Gaussian. It could be any other distribution which gives us independent and identically distributed stochastic events. So we perform a series of measurements, X, which is now given by a set from X zero, X one, up to some X of N minus one. So these are measurements. And each one of these measurements produces some expectation value. So you could think of X zero containing a series of measurements we made. So we would then have an X zero bar, which then would be given by one divided by M here, the set of measurements we have. And this uh, has now a summation from i equals zero to m minus one. And then I would have my x zero of i here. And we would have the same for all the other quantities. Now, each one of these measurements, so in, I'm going to use a little bit sloppy notation now. And this sloppy notation, I'm going to let this x0 bar to be replaced by x0. So x0 is now a mean value. Now, what we can uh, uh, do then is actually to define a new series of uh, mean values. So we can define a z here, which is a sum of all these experiments, which we have to begin with x0 plus x1 up to x n minus one and divide that by n. Now the question then is, which probability distribution does Z follow? And I'm going to just call this for Z. So we are now asking, what is the probability distribution of this quantity here? So if I have independent and identically distributed variables X, what we can show then is that the central limit theorem simply states, limit theorem that states that this distribution P of Z times D of Z is going to be a Gaussian or a normal distribution with a specific standard deviation and the mean value. So it's a Gaussian. And you can actually show that this distribution here and I'm not going to go through the details because we will find them in the lecture notes, but we are going to need this when we are going to discuss the different uh, stochastic variables, which we, and the method like the blocking and, and bootstrap, which uh, we are going to use to uh, estimate properly the standard deviations. So what you would find then is that this P of Z, DZ is going to be given by a one over two of pi, and I'm going to write a sigma divided by n here. And then there's an exponential minus, and then I have z minus mu here. And I'm going to come back to what this mu is divided by two of sigma squared divided by n. Sorry, let me just rewrite it. So this is the square root two, and that has that one. So this mu is the original expectation value of the individual experiments we had, these x's. 
And this sigma squared is actually the standard for the variance of uh, x minus this mu squared of p of x d of x. So what we're having is a value of z because these are independent and identically distributed. So it means that this expectation value z, which you see here, is simply given by the different expectation values. And these are given by mu. And if they are identically distributed with the same distribution and independent, that means that x0 is mu, x1 is mu, xn minus one is mu. We get n times mu divided by n. So that is mu, which you see here. So that's also the expectation value for z. But then what happens is that we get a new distribution. So we have a new distribution with all these measurements. New distribution with a new standard deviation or a new variance with variance, which is now changed, which is given by sigma squared divided by this quantity n. And that means that we have a standard deviation which is going to be given by sigma divided by square root of n. And this is the important result then that we, what we are getting now is something which preserves the mean value. So the mean value of z, which we wrote as z here, is the same as the mean value of the axis. So we keep the same mean value. So that doesn't change. So we are actually making just a transformation to a new probability by collecting lots of uh, uh, experiments done with one probability distribution. And we can show that in the limit of uh, uh, n goes to infinity, the probability distribution which we get is a Gaussian. And it has a standard deviation, which is now given by the, the variance of the individual measurements divided by the square root of the number of measurements. So that means that we are going to narrow down the error which we make when we now make repeated calculations. So after the break, we are going to look at uh, what this means for us when we are running calculations. And the quantities which we are going to derive, they are going to be important for the analysis of the blocking method, which is the next topic which we are going to deal with. And now we're just going to take a small break, but I just wanted to set up the machinery which is needed in order to understand the blocking method. And this is the method of choice when you have uh, millions and millions of uh, Monte Carlo results. So it's different from the case when you have few cycles, no, a few uh, samples. With few samples, people tend to use a bootstrap method. So after the break, we are going to look at the kind of mathematics which we need in order to understand the basics of the blocking method. And then next week, we are going to show how you can implement that one when you have uh, calculated the optimal uh, uh, variational parameters and you just then launch the big Monte Carlo calculation. So I went a little bit over time, but I just wanted to remind you of some of these statistical quantities, which you may have seen scattered a little bit here and there in different courses. And in the lecture notes, you will also find a derivation of the central limit theorem. Here, I just wanted to state it. And uh, this uh, is actually a very important result, which is for instance, used as a basis for the bootstrap method. Okay, so I'm going to uh, put the recording on pause and whatever. Okay, so what we need to do now is to go through some uh, not too exciting technicalities and in order to link uh, the calculation of uh, the various stochastic expectation values with uh, what we're going to do with this blocking method. Uh, in the meantime, we will also discuss as an aside, the bootstrap method, which is also widely used in Monte Carlo calculations. But the benefit which we have in the type of calculation we are running is that we can produce easily millions and millions of samples. Whereas when you use the bootstrap method, you could perhaps have something like a thousand to 2000 uh, final expectation values. And uh, these would be your uh, data samples, which you then 
want to use to calculate or to estimate the standard deviation. So if you run something like a lattice quantum chromodynamics calculation, which is very expensive and where calculation can run for weeks, you would have much less data than what we can produce uh, in these kind of variational Monte Carlo calculations of, uh, of uh, quantum mechanical expectation values with pretty simple uh, trial wave functions. And even with obviously also large numbers of particles. So what we're going to do now is the following. So we are going to assume, so these are just technicalities. We assume that we have a, run a series of exper experiments. So we assume we have the M experiments. So this could be you uh, performing some set of experiments each uh, evening, for instance, uh, if you don't have any problems with the uh, uh, time, with your spare time. So suppose you run this set of experiments and each experiment has a given number of observations. And each experiment has n observations. So this is the kind of setup which we have here. And you could now think of the m when we're going to parallelize our Monte Carlo code. m could now be the uh, uh, number of processes which we are running independently of the other ones. And then n here could then represent the number of Monte Carlo cycles which we run. So this is a typical setting actually for the kind of calculations which we will end up doing. So the uh, n observations which we have means that each experiment, if we label this experiment with a uh, name alpha, so let's say that we have an experiment alpha, this could be one evening when we make a set of measurements. This has an expectation value, mu alpha, which is now simply the mean value of all the samples. So this is normally called the sample average. So this runs from K equal one up to the number of experiments I have. And then I write the observation alpha. This is for experiment alpha, and this is observation K. So this shouldn't be a very surprising result. So this would be the sample mean for that specific experiment. And then we have a variance which we could calculate for these experiments. And that would be given by one over N. And then I have a sum over K equal one up to N. And then I have my X alpha of K minus this mu of alpha and this is square. Now, remember that these quantities which we calculate, since we don't know the probability distribution, we don't know whether these experiments give us the correct mean value. So assume that the X's they follow some specific distribution, then if we have this distribution, we could calculate the exact mean value. And that may deviate from what we have here. So it may deviate, and we don't know how much it deviates by. Now then we repeat these experiments m times. So m times. You could now think of this re repeating your experiments of the n evenings. And that means that we would have a mean value, mu of m, which is given by one over m. And when we have alpha equal to one up to m, and this is our mu alpha, which again would be given by one over m n. And I have a sum over alpha and k. And this is given by x of alpha k. And uh, if you go back to the case which we discussed before the break, we uh, saw then that the mean value doesn't change. If we assume that these are uh, identically distributed and independent events, that may not be the case. If we have independent and identically distributed, uh, the distribution which is going to govern the uh, final expectation values are going to be given by a uh, Gaussian distribution. Now we can then calculate the total uh, variance. 
And the total variance is something which I will label with a sigma squared m. And this is given by one over m. And what I could do now, I could take just simply the variances, which I have. No, sorry, the mean values, mu of alpha, minus this mu of m. So where I now treat uh, every observation which I, I do in a specific uh, day, this experiment alpha, that produces a mean value. And this can then be rewritten in terms of uh, the other quantities. So I can actually rewrite this now in terms of uh, the following. So let me just quickly do that. So I have a sigma, that's a sum over m, and then I have a sum over n here, and then I would have now my sum over alpha and the sum over k here, and this is going to be given by this mu, oh, no, sorry, x alpha k. minus mu of n here, and this is square. Now the uh, quantity which, so I can rewrite actually this quantity here in a slightly different way. And uh, if we now rewrite it, we can show that this is given by one over m. I separate out the alpha, which goes from one up to m. And then I have a one over n here. And then I have a sum over k equal to one. So it's actually not so difficult to show this. This is an x alpha k. And then I have a one over n. And this is an x alpha of l. And then I have l equal to one up to n. Minus this mu of m squared. So this is just a simple rewrite of the equation which we have. And if we continue along this line, we can show that this is equal to one over n and n squared. And then I have a sum over alpha equal one up to m. I have a sum over kl equal one up to n here. And then I have my x alpha k minus mu of m multiplied with x alpha of l minus mu of m. It's actually not so difficult to see that these manipulations here actually lead to what we have. And this is something which I can rewrite as, if you now look at the sums here, I can take out the sum where k is equal to l, so I can rewrite that one in terms of one over m of n squared, and I have a sum over alpha and k, and now I'm skipping the limits here. And this is x alpha of k minus mu of m squared, and plus two divided by m and n squared, and now I have a summation of alpha equal to one up to m. And I have a summation here because this is a symmetric product. So that means I can actually set it up as a summation of a k less than l. And that's why I have this factor of two here. I could alternatively just rewrite this as a double sum over k and l, but where k is now different from l because I've singled out the contribution where k is equal to l. And this is again equal to x alpha of k minus mu of m. And this is multiplied with x alpha of l minus mu of m. So what we have then, if we now, I now can make a, a distribute a new calculation here. And I can define what I'm going to call, so I have the total variance, but I could think of the sample variance of all m n experiments. And this is a quantity which I will define as a sigma squared, which is given by one over m times n. And this is actually different from this total variance, which I put up, 
and it's going to be given by an x alpha k minus mu of m squared. And now you see that I can actually rewrite the quantity which we had previously, this sigma of m, which I label as a total variance. So this quantity here, it, I have singled out the uh, term where I have uh, k equal to l, and then I'm left with a reminder term here. Sorry, not that one, but this term here. And then I have a reminder term. And this reminder term is actually nothing but the covariance. So the second term, which you see is a covariance, I can rewrite this in terms of this uh, sample variance of all the MN experiments. And uh, what I get then is that my sigma of M squared can now be written out in terms of sigma squared divided by N plus this covariance. And where the covariance now is something which I've defined as and this is this quantity which we have up here, two divided by m and n squared. And this contains now a sum over alpha equal one up to m. And then I have my sums over k, this is a double sum of n of x alpha of k minus mu of m multiplied with this x alpha of l minus mu of m. So this measures the degrees of correlations between two observation x alpha of k and x alpha of l. So this would be two types of observations in different uh, times of the same measurements. So what I can do now, if we look at these calculations here, I have a uh, variance which can be rewritten in terms of a uh, quantity which uh, simply looks at the sample variance of all the MN experiments, which is this quantity here. So if I calculate that quantity, this quantity here, and I assume that the covariance is zero, then I would simply have a simple recipe by which I can calculate the, uh, the, uh, the, the total variance. So I want you now to think a little bit about what is going on here. And if you look at the expressions which we have, these specific expressions here, you see now that uh, if the covariance is equal to zero, then what we have is that this sigma of m squared is actually given by sigma squared divided by n. And that reminds you of the formula which we had for the uh, uh, central limit theorem. So we have the uh, experiment, which we define as sigma squared, which is now the sum of all these MN experiments. And this contains just a single loop. So if you now run your Monte Carlo calculation, what it means is that you can actually calculate this one at the same level as you calculate the energy, because the energy is simply now a loop over all the experiments which are running. If you look at the covariance on the other hand, so the covariance here includes a double loop. It's a double loop. In terms of this term K less than L. And if you now have a standard situation like the one which you are going to see in your Monte Carlo calculation, you have uh, typically millions and millions of Monte Carlo uh, estimates. So that means that each such X alpha K comes in the order of millions. And if you have uh, just a single sum, you would perform 1 million operations where you sum of all these numbers. But if you have a double loop, you have to have a 1 million times a million. And this is going to slow down the calculations. And we don't want to evaluate that. So what you're going to do with this kind of calculational strategies uh, in, a, in the setup of the code in order to evaluate the variance properly is to produce an array of observations 
And sometimes people actually uh, produce these observations in chunks of a uh, hundred. So you run a hundred observations and then you store the hundred value. You run a new hundred ones and you store that value, or you can store all the values. So you would actually produce an array of observations X alpha of K. And as I said, a typical Monte Carlo calculation, which you are going to run, will contain uh, millions of such uh, observations. Now, clearly, you can now write this to, uh, to file, or you can store them, and then do the post analysis. So in the statistical post analysis, which is coming now, post analysis, we're actually going to use these results. Analysis, we will use these uh, X alpha K as our observations. So just think of uh, uh, you running the calculation now. So you would have uh, your uh, highly, uh, uh, how to say, fine-tuned variational Monte Carlo calculation or code. And then you use this one to just generate the data. And then when you generated the data, that is where we will use statistical tools to perform the analysis. So if you now uh, look at the type, type of machinery which we are going to develop. So the first step, step one, is to find the optimal parameters alpha. And when we found the optimal parameter, we have the next step here, two. And then we run our VMC calculation. And this can be run in parallel. And the VMC calculation writes to file or stores and then produces and produce these outputs, X alpha of K. In our case, these are going to be the energies which we produce. And then the final stage is the statistical post analysis. And in this statistical post analysis, what we do then is to evaluate, to evaluate the expectation values. So the expectation value is this quantity X alpha of K and appropriate evaluation of the sigma squared. So I'm just writing sigma squared in, in this simplified way here. So these are the basic uh, three steps which we now are going to uh, uh, discuss. So we have already, we have one, uh, we have a Monte Carlo code. So that means that we can actually set this up. So one and two should be within reach for most of you. If you have uh, added the uh, uh, optimization part. And that means that the next step, which we need to look at now is actually the statistical post analysis. This is a standard strategy. This means that the, uh, the point which you see here this specific top point. This is where you also have the optimized code, which is parallelized. And uh, next week, when we are done with the statistical uh, analysis tools, we are going to look at the way we're going to parallelize the code and how we can produce large data sets, which then enter the statistical post analysis. So this is basically the kind of recipe which we are now going to set up. So you can think of the statistical analysis as something which is not included in your Monte Carlo calculation, but that your Monte Carlo calculation produces the numbers which you see here, and they are fed into the statistical analysis. Now, even if you uh, don't produce the covariance in your Monte Carlo calculation, so it would be extremely slow if you were to calculate this quantity here, when you set up your variational Monte Carlo code, because you would have to have a double loop over K and L, and that will really slow down your calculations and it will never end. So, but if you do a statistical post analysis, to calculate this covariance is a quantity which is going to require a lot of time. And you can test that easily yourself if you produce a thousand 
data points, X alpha K, and you calculate the covariance, that would be a thousand times a thousand evaluations. And you increase that one to 10,000, you will see a considerable increase in computational time. And if you have millions of data, you will then have to perform these uh, double sums for millions of data, and that is not wanted. So these methods, which we are going to look at now, the blocking method and the bootstrap methods, are methods which are used to circumvent the calculation of this double loop. So let's just state that. So the bootstrap, which is a very popular method, bootstrap and also a variant of that one, an earlier variant, the jackknife. Lots of funny names here. And the boot and the blocking, these are just statistical resampling methods, which are going to allow us to calculate the covariance without having to perform the calculation of a double loop. So let's just state that. And then we go back to the definitions here. So bootstrap and blocking produce or evaluate the covariance without calculating a double loop. Evaluating the double loop. So one way to see this now is um, um, by rewriting the equation which we had. So we're going to introduce a shorthand notation because that is what is going to link us with the uh, calculation of uh, the blocking method. So with this shorthand, I'm, I'm going to define a function f of d, which is now going to be given by n divided by m. And I'm going to have a sum of alpha equal to one up to m here. And then I have a sum from k equal one up to a quantity n minus d. And you will see why this uh, is going to be handy. Because then with that quantity there, I can actually, and this is multiplied with x alpha plus d. So instead of having this definition of the quantity L in the double uh, sum which I had, I now look at the distance between k and L. So minus mu. And this d here is now defined as the absolute value of the distance between k and L. And we can now uh, define a quantity, which I'm going to call the autocorrelation function. And this autocorrelation function is given by this uh, K of D or cap of D. And it's given by this quantity f of d divided by sigma squared. And you can see now if I take f of zero, which means that d is equal to zero, this quantity, when we now use the definition, it becomes m and it has a one over n. And then I have an alpha equal to one up to n, m, sorry. And then I have k equal one up to n. And this is equal to x alpha of k minus mu of m squared. And that means that this function here is actually equal to the variance which we defined previously, the sigma squared. And that means that this function of kappa zero is actually equal to sigma squared divided by sigma squared which is then equal to one. So what I'm uh, going to do now with these kind of definitions is actually to rewrite uh, this total variance in terms of these quantities. So what I can do now is to rewrite with these definitions, I can rewrite the total variance in terms of this quantity sigma squared divided by n plus two divided by n 
and then I have a loop of a d equal one up to n minus one. And this contains now this function f of b, which I introduced here. And I can rewrite this again, since I have this uh, uh, correlation function, the autocorrelation function, which contains my sigma squared. I can now rewrite this as my sigma squared divided by n. And then I have a one plus two of sum over d equal to one of n minus one. And then I have this correlation function uh, kappa of d. And this is extremely useful now because uh, when you now look at this uh, correlation function, so it has a value when d is equal to zero, which is uh, one, that's an exact value. So if I look at this uh, term kappa of d here, and I have d on the x-axis. So when I put zero, this is exactly equal to one. And then I have values one, two, three, etc., up to the final value of uh, n minus one here. So d takes these values. Now the hope then is that when I now look at these correlation functions for different values of d, which is the distance between two observations, my hope then is that the covariance is going to be small. So what you will typically see when you run these calculations is then that hopefully when the distance becomes larger and larger, then this uh, quantity, which we call the uh, autocorrelation function becomes smaller and smaller. And at the end, it should just vanish, which means that this is a kind of measure on how correlated specific events are. So we are now looking at the correlations between different events. Uh, unfortunately, in Monte Carlo calculations, since we do have uh, random numbers which are generated by deterministic algorithms, there will be correlations due to the random numbers. Actually, the, the uh, calculations which I'm setting up here with this autocorrelation function is something which is used to test the quality of a random number generator. So ideally, you want the numbers to be independent of each other, which means then that the covariance should be as close to zero as possible or preferentially equal to zero. And uh, in that sense, the uh, a perfect uh, autocorrelation function would have zeros except for d equal to zero, which means that then we just have the ratio between the variance divided by the variance. Now, why do we stress this? Now we stress this because the calculation of uh, the total variance, this is the quantity we want to evaluate based on all of our Monte Carlo cycles, which we have uh, we're used to produce the data. And remember now that this M could represent the number of processes which you have in a parallelization. What we want this to uh, is to have a, a as reliably as possible estimate of the variance, because this quantity here is in turn used to calculate the standard deviation. Now, if we uh, don't take into account the uh, covariance, we will have an over-optimistic estimation of the result because this quantity here is a positive quantity. So that means that since this is also a positive quantity, if we now take away this term here, it means that we will have a variance which is too small. And what we would like to see now, when we now uh, perform the calculations is something like this. So if we look at this uh, uh, variance, and we make a plot now of the variance as a function of this variable D here, which uh, enters this uh, uh, autocorrelation function. So let's now put that one here. And now we are looking at the total variance, sigma squared. And we know that when uh, the value is equal to zero, what happens then is that we have a value here for the variance. So this would be sigma squared divided by n. Now, when you now add the covariance term, you what you will get then 
is something which starts increasing. And hopefully this flattens out at the specific value of D. Now, when it flattens out at a specific value of D, it means that the, the events then are no longer correlated. So when uh, this specific quantity is uh, cap of D or F of D, when you reach uh, a distance between the different experiments, uh, which simply says that they're not correlated anymore, then this curves actually flattens out. And this region where it flattens out is the one which is of interest for us, because that's where we, when this flattens out, this is actually where we uh, can claim that the variance now, which we're evaluating, is independent of the distance between various experiments. So keep this in mind. So we have different sources of these kind of correlations. So one type of correlations comes simply because we have a correlated system. So quantum mechanical systems are inherently inherently correlated. And the thing then which we can ask ourselves is uh, what kind of degree of correlations do we have? Do they pervade uh, all measurements? And in addition to that, we have correlations due to the way the random numbers are simply calculated. So in our case, we will have often two types of correlations, one which is related to the random numbers and one which is related to inherent quantum mechanical correlations. So the um, uh, thing which we then need to find is a method which allows us to estimate this region in a reliable way without having to calculate the double sum which we have here. Sorry, not that double sum. I'm just confusing you guys now. So we don't want to evaluate the covariance. And this is the motivation behind these methods because the covariance is a double loop. So I hope you see the kind of overarching uh, kind of message which we're going to deal with. And uh, there are basically two methods which try to uh, give an evaluation of this uh, standard deviation in a reliable way. And uh, these are the blocking and the, uh, and the bootstrap methods. So let's start looking at the uh, first resampling method, which is actually pretty simple. And then uh, when you do this, you will see why the blocking method is preferred compared with the bootstrap method. So let's now look at the first resampling method here. And this is a bootstrap method. So what we have is a data set. So let's just write this out in terms of X1, X2. So these are the set, the observations which we are making up to some kind of X of N. So the bootstrap algorithm means that uh, we are going now to perform a series of operations. So we're going to have the M bootstrap operations. And these bootstrap operations contain now the following. So we would have a loop. So for I equal one up to M. So then the first set is actually to uh, use the data set which you have. So compute a mean value with a data set. And we're gonna compute this one by labeling the mu of i and a sigma of i squared. Then what we will do next is to reshuffle the data randomly. Data randomly. And what we are doing then is actually by selecting endpoints with a replacement. By selecting endpoints. So this is the whole data set which we have, endpoints by replacement, which means that we can have one observation more than one time. So that means that we produce a new data set, which we're going to call X prime. And this is going to give us an X3 
could be look like this x5 we could have x5 again we could have x1 here and this goes all the way up to some x final which is some x suppose now we have 50 data points uh, we could now have something like an n minus 33 just to give an example so these are just reshuffle and what can happen when we do this kind of reshuffling with the replacement is that we can have the same observation appearing more than once. Now, what we do next then is with this data set is actually to compute in the next loop. So we have performed this reshuffling. So we would now compute the mu of i plus one and sigma of i plus one with this new data set of x prime here. And then we repeat till we reach the end of the loop. So repeat till this i is equal to n, which is the number of bootstraps which we perform. And that gives the end of this uh, do loop which we have here. And then when we have this is the, uh, uh, is that we calculate with that, we would then uh, finally, the final stage is to compute the final averages, final stage. That is to compute the final average, final mu, which is then going to be the sum of all these bootstrapped quantities. So we would have M bootstraps and that goes from I equal one up to M. And then we have this mu of I. Which we have for every bootstrap reshuffling. And then we would also calculate the final value for Sigma. So a Sigma squared will then be given by M. And in this specific case, what we will do now is simply to use the value which we have, we would have this mu of i's minus this final value mu here, squared. Or alternatively, you could just take the uh, sigmas you have for each single case and simply uh, add them up. So the bootstrap method is very simple and you can show that for independent and identically distributed variables, it actually converges to the correct result. Now, the problem here, as you can see rather quickly, is that if you now have uh, only a hundred or thousand data points, this is easy to run. But in our case, we are going to have millions of data points. And that means that we are going to spend a lot of cycles on the statistical resampling and evaluation of the standard errors and mean values. So simply due to the way the bootstrap method is set up, it becomes less convenient when we have huge amounts of data. And that's why the uh, blocking method is uh, the prevalent method when we have large data sets. So for large data sets, which is our case, data sets, this becomes inefficient in the, in the statistical post analysis. This requires many floating point operations, requires many floating point operations, flops. For larger than it requires many floating point operations to evaluate, to perform the, the statistical post analysis. And this leads to the next method, which is the blocking method. And this is the method we will discuss next week. And uh, with that, we should have all the ingredients which are needed to add this element in the statistical post analysis. So what I would recommend here, since I will provide you with the Python scripts which do this, you can actually use these Python scripts and run your final post analysis separately from the variational Monte Carlo calculation. This is also the standard approach which is used by 
basically all practitioners. So you have your VMC code, as we uh, set up a little bit earlier here. If we now go back a little bit. So we have the VMC code, which is the uh, machinery which generates the results, where we do actually the high performance computations. And then when these calculations are ended, then that is when we will typically perform the statistical post analysis. And there we will provide you, and actually you will find the scripts in the, in the lecture slides. We will provide you with uh, uh, Python scripts which do this post analysis. And that's something which is often done separately after you have run the calculations. So view the uh, Monte Carlo machinery here as just as a tool to generate as much statistical data as you can. Okay, so this is going to end uh, today's session. And uh, uh, I'm gonna stop the recording.